We're now going to turn our attention to the impact of artificial intelligence and automation on labor law issues. There's a lot of new stuff happening in, uh, with respect to artificial intelligence and automation. I would submit, and we'll see if the panel bears this out, I think we have simply got a lot of new wrinkles on old issues that we have been dealing with in labor law over the years. We have a very distinguished panel whose biographies are in the materials uh, to address this issue. Uh, management lawyer Howard Robbins, a partner at Proskauer. Union lawyer Bill Ansbach from the firm of Friedman and Ansbach. And Professor Paul Secunda, who has written extensively on this area and I think is going to raise uh, a very interesting uh, insight. Can you speak up, folks? Sure. Yeah, Are these not working? I think I don't. Okay. I can't give you a technical, uh, All right. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I understand that Howard's going to lead this thing off, so go ahead, Howard. So I'm told. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, uh, I have about uh, 10 pounds of stuff to put in a five pound bag, so I will go uh, sort of quickly uh, through this. Um, and stop me if what I'm saying does not merge with what's on the, uh, the slide there. So I thought I'd, I'd start with um, an observation by uh, Barack Obama in his farewell address, who said that the, the next wave of economic dislocation won't come from overseas, it will come from the relentless pace of automation that makes many good middle class jobs obsolete. I, I was going to leave his name out and ask you which of the last two presidents made that statement, um, but I, I figured you uh, yeah, I might give you a hint. Um, I think the, the difference between uh, AI as it affects the workplace, and, and I'll get into I want I want to be less theoretical perhaps than some of the articles uh, that you may have been reading. Uh, there's a lot that's been written, um, extensive books about the effect on workers, but I want to dig into what we might see actually at the bargaining table. Um, and actual legal issues uh, around this. And one of the differences, I think, about uh, AI from the automation that we've seen in the past is that we're talking about judgments made by machines, uh, not just the processing of information, not just, not just faster, but actual the, the thinking. And, of course, that's the I in, in, in the AI. Um, and that, that for these systems to work, the AI systems, they have to be given control to actually uh, have effects on them. And what does that mean for, uh, for the modern workplace? Um, and, and one question is, where does this all end? Um, it's hard to have the vision to see where this really all goes. And I thought there was a nice observation by this guy, Larry Tesler, who invented copy and paste, uh, which may seem mundane, but I'm sure there's a lot of money in that. And he mm -hmm. said, um, human intelligence is whatever machines haven't done yet. Um, so I was relieved to hear Chairman Ring say that the rules that he's uh, passing won't eliminate our jobs, but some of this stuff uh, may. Um, so that's uh, good news and, uh, uh, and bad news. So um, with artificial intelligence developing and arriving in, in the workplace, uh, one of the, I think, the key things to, to think about is that um, it's going to change not just the way work is, is done, but how it gets evaluated. And I want to get to that later about the law around employer uh, evaluation of employees and monitoring of of employees, and that the laws we have now um, were designed, as with so much, these were uh, square pegs and uh, for round holes that, that we're, now, uh, we're now developing. And uh, I remember when I was uh, here in the law school taking civil procedure, John Sexton, um, uh, one of the things that stuck with me, maybe the only thing, was that he said, everything is definition. Um, and, uh, and I was thinking about that here, where so much of what we argue about in, in labor law is, who is an employee? Who is a supervisor? And one question is if, if the computers are exercising judgment and making decisions about who should be hired um, and indeed perhaps who should be fired someday, um, what's left of a supervisor? Is there independent judgment being exercised? These are all sorts of things that have yet to play out. And I, I imagine I'll be just raising a lot more questions during this, this time than, than providing answers. Um, but that, I think, is a key, um, a key thing to, um, to think about. Um, this concern is not new about the end of work and, and what will happen to it. Um, there was a panel convened by uh, President Johnson in 1964, National Commission on Technology, Automation, and Economic Progress, uh, and the team that was assembled, this blue ribbon panel, um, uh, recommended a guaranteed income 
for each family as a potential measure to deal with automation. And so all the stuff we're hearing about with the guaranteed income, uh, I mean, this is, this is not a new fear, um, but I do think that technology has now gotten to the place that, that we may actually, um, actually see that. And, and one difference is just the speed of it, um, that the time that is involved and the expectations around bargaining over these issues and how long that takes, um, and the ability to compete in the face of those sorts of timetables, uh, and about things like the WARN Act, where it's contemplated that, not to fear, we'll give you 60 days to retrain yourself, and I'm sure you'll find another job during that time, <laughs> right? Um, but when the world is changing so fast, and there is the polarization of everything, and the disappearance of the middle, not just economically, but the disappearance of the jobs in the middle in terms of skill sets, and what's left is only the very highest level, and then the very lowest level, um, what does it really mean to offer retraining uh, in, this, in this day and age? And so these are, I think, some of the, um, the fundamental questions that, that come up. And sort of with that background, I um, thought we might talk for a few minutes about the, um, uh, the duty to bargain and, and how uh, AI uh, may Im impact that. So, of course, there's a, a duty to bargain, and, and first national maintenance um, is a um, case we, you know, probably the most cited case ever about um, the categories um, of, of bargaining subjects. And, and there are uh, those things that um, are within the core of entrepreneurial control um, and really just um, exclusive within the province of the, uh, of the employer. Um, uh, there are those things that, that, you know, that have an indirect impact on, on employment, like advertising. You don't have to bargain about those. But it's the middle where the, the argument uh, goes, where there is a direct impact on employment, um, um, but they're focused on something separate. Uh, from that, and there's the balancing between the employer's uh, need for decision making and the benefit of bargaining. And this gets in part to the issue of speed I just mentioned. Um, how do we weigh the benefit of bargaining when change comes um, so so quickly? And so something just to look back on. I don't, I'm not going to do an exhaustive look at at cases. There just isn't time and and. Uh, um, or, or even interest, perhaps, uh, in the audience. But um, something to think about when there are mixed motives um, around, uh, around change. And here are just a couple of circuit court cases that um, were useful um, reference point, where um, if, if there's a mix of um, labor costs at the root of a decision, but also Im uh, improvements and, and changes, entrepreneurial decisions, it doesn't have to be, have to be bargained uh, or not. And, and so, um, you know, here's the, the First Circuit saying that when there's a, a mixed bag, you got to bargain over the, over the decision to implement change. Um, and, uh, and the D.C. Circuit, in a in recent case, looking for um, a link between the non-labor cost reasons for the decision um, uh, and, and what, what the, uh, the decision is. And, and in, um, uh, in, the, in this case, the, uh, the court noted that um, uh, the First National Maintenance, what I just referenced, said seemingly left open the issue of whether layoffs prompted by modernization are mandatory subjects of bargaining. Um, uh, and uh, in this, this Pan Am case, there have been modernization as a result of environmental uh, requirements. Um, and uh, the board found a duty to bargain over the layoffs that resulted from these efficiencies because the, the layoffs weren't solely due to modernization. It was basically a, a sort of a, a right line uh, analysis. Um, and so I, I say that just uh, as an introduction to the concept that with AI, um, there is not just cheaper, but if you've got thinking being done, I think you're going to see a lot more, and I dare say at the bargaining table, anybody who sees me there will hear me say a lot more, this isn't about labor costs, this is about doing something smarter. Here's a machine actually thinking, um, and I'm not just doing it, it faster, I've got a, a brain that's different and it's going to be improved. Um, and I think it'll be a different kind of exercise when you talk about um, automation uh, in the future. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, under the first national maintenance framework, um, again, you know, it may be about labor costs, but it's also about this entrepreneurial decision. Uh, and the line um, is, is for sure blurry, but think about some of the situations where this comes up, and particularly with uh, automated um, uh, vehicles, self-driving uh, trucks and, and taxis and such. Um, uh, so for sure, there is an enormous safety uh, aspect to these things. Um, uh, as I, don't, I don't know of a computer that drinks um, or that needs health care or plans to retire uh, or harasses its coworkers or all, all the various um, uh, things like that. Um, but for sure, the, uh, there's an enormous labor cost savings to be involved. And how is that going to be evaluated 
um, at the bargaining table in terms of the, um, uh, the right to do that. Uh, there, there's also, uh, and there's been some, some litigation about the, um, the analysis whether you should be looking at in automation um, uh, situations. Do you look at first national maintenance? Do you look at uh, the fiber board uh, case? And do you think of it kind of like uh, uh, outsourcing? Um, I'm not gonna answer that question, but just say that, that, that there's been uh, some struggling over that. And I will note that Justice Stewart, in his opinion in the fiber board case, which I think is actually referred to more often than, than uh, the other uh, opinions in that decision, um, uh, said uh, that while a company's decision to invest in labor-saving machinery clearly imperils job security, it should not be considered a mandatory subject because this type of managerial decision is entrepreneurial in nature. And he thought that the legislature and not the court should address the impact of technological change on labor. So I guess we're all still waiting for that, um, uh, you know, going on 55 years, um, 55 years later. Um, uh, a lot of the early cases, um, those who have done work in the uh, newspaper industry, saw this play out uh, to some extensive degree when there was a switch from, if anybody could, most of you in this room sort of looking around, I still get a, a hard copy newspaper at my door. Um, I, my kids think that's hilarious. Um, uh, but once upon a time, it was not just that, it was there was hot type, right? So the, the, the lead got melted at night or whatever they did. And then when the switch came to offset printing to cold type, um, uh, there, uh, there were big jurisdictional disputes within the newspaper industry uh, about the transformation of these jobs and who really was doing whose, whose job at, at that point. Um, and so what became of the composing room when that work was kind of moving elsewhere within the, um, uh, within the, the newspaper. And so uh, you see a lot of, of those issues uh, coming up today and the board has, excuse me, has observed in uh, some uh, earlier cases that automation by definition creates blurriness with respect to the scope of a bargaining unit. Um, and I think one difference with AI um, is that it's not going to be just the shifting of who does the work, it's gonna be just complete elimination. Um, and, and the scope of replacement of a worker may be different um, in, the, uh, in the future world. Um, let's make sure I have, right, what have I got? Um, so um, uh, there are, and, and along these lines, just think about some cases that have come up, and I'm sure there are others, about whether it's been total elimination or, or only partial. So um, the board has long, you know, long ago decided, um, I think one of the early cases was this uh, KUMU radio case, that, um, that when there's automation resulting in the elimination of, of unit jobs, you gotta bargain over the decision to install that automated equipment and the effects of, of, that, of that decision. Uh, and this Plymouth Locomotive Works decision was interesting. It was an early case of a computer replacing a human timekeeper who had been keeping track of what people had been doing and how much time it took them. And a computer could absorb a lot of that data. Um, and, and this case, Regal Cinemas, this is when you no longer needed like the film Cinema Paradiso with the complicated reel-to-reel -reel films and splicing that you just hit a switch and, and the projector would run. But always there was still somebody needed to do something. Um, and so these cases, I think in, in a lot of ways hinged on there still being some remaining work um, and so I think we're confronting an era, or soon will be, where there won't be any remaining work at all. You just have complete replacement. Um, there's now technology even to the point that, you know, a machine can start flipping the burgers and, and the customer has a direct line to whoever is at the very beginning of that chain. And so just one, you know, think to yourself whether um, that changes the legal framework or not. And, and would these cases have come out differently if there wasn't any remaining component at all? In the Regal Cinemas case, um, the employer was found to have uh, failed to bargain because there were still some people doing something. The managers went around into the different theaters and the multiplexes and had to do something. Um, and we may be moving past that, um, uh, that phase. Just some technology that, that I would note. I mean, store clerks um, who keep track of inventory and take payments you go to the airport, you just check out yourself. Um, and Amazon Go has a store now where there's not even any checkout at all. It's like uh, Easy Pass, apparently. When you walk through, um, uh, they read whatever you're, you're holding. Um, uh, say, you know, yes? Can I just ask you a question about Regal? I just have not read yeah. it. Right. 
No, no, this was a case saying that, that there was a duty to bargain before that shift happened and whether the union could have some held on to that work and maybe if I were the union, I suppose I would have argued, okay, maybe you don't need three projectionists, but you could still have one um, and maybe um, uh, is that really a managerial job if half their work is going around turning on the projectors? What's really a manager? I mean, they might have lost anyway, I suppose, but the employer just did it without even engaging in, in the discussion. So that's what was, um, what was going on there. Yep. Um, there we are. Um, so um, uh, just getting into the um, uh, concept of, uh, of, of what happens to a, uh, a bargaining unit with auto, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence and the blurring potentially of unit boundaries. And, and will a union be in a position, thinking about the Regal case, as these things morph, will they morph so completely um, that uh, it's hard to say w what the bargaining unit um, really looks like at that, uh, at that point. Um, and, um, uh, and so in the fiber board case, just an example, where there was a threat by um, uh, subcontracting, um, uh, one of the, the inherent byproducts of automation is this blurring of uh, bargaining unit boundaries. And, and the NLRB made that observation in this Columbia Tribune broadcasting case. This is one of these, uh, uh, these newspaper cases. And it was the NLRB that, that uh, even then talked about bargaining units losing definition in the context of, um, uh, of automation. Excuse me, of automation. Um, one thing that um, uh, I find has, just I'll say anecdotally for me, has come up um, a lot recently is employers using data to really want to, as they've got more data, to evaluate employees based on that greater set of information. And this is only going to be amplified um, as we um, move forward with auto, um, artificial intelligence and the enormous collection of data that's, uh, that's available. And so unions understandably um, uh, want to be involved in that process. I might say resist, but I'll say want to be involved in, in that process. Um, uh, and there are also different ways in which supervision may happen, and I think one of the things that will, my crystal ball says that the ways in which supervision may happen, and whether it, it needs to be bargained over or not, will also shift as technology advances, and I'll get into to some of these things um, uh, in a moment. So, um, uh, just as background, I won't uh, bore you with all the cases, just for interest of time, but, but it is a mandatory bargaining subject if you want to introduce an evaluation system, the board decided that that long ago, <clears throat> but it is not um, a, um, a mandatory subject if you're simply shifting the technology with which you, uh, that you use to make those evaluations. So the, the case that um, uh, most uh, people refer to as a Rustcraft case where it was a shift from manual timekeeping to automated timekeeping. And so employer didn't have to bargain about, about that. But, but where is the line between a new evaluation system that radically changes the scrutiny of employees um, and that Rustcraft concept. So I don't know if anybody has seen these happy or not um, kiosks or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they look very friendly, right? They look very nice. There are smiley faces on them. There's an unhappy face at the end, but they hope you don't push that. Um, uh, and, and they seem harmless enough. But what's fascinating about, about these, and the New Yorker had a, a great article, is that if they are placed in multiple areas uh, within a, a customer serving workplace, whether it's a, a, a football stadium or a retail store, um, the customer input um, can, when aggregated, do much more than a supervisor could ever do. And it can identify exactly which employee at which time of day was responsible for making somebody either happy or unhappy. Uh, and so the logical endpoint of this um, is that a, a computer may eventually say, this person's really got to go, right? Um, and it's, it's a skill that a, a supervisor just wouldn't have had the ability to understand. It's a kind of monitoring um, with this aggregation of enormous amounts of data um, that goes beyond anything like the feedback you get on social media, right? Because those are cranks, right? Who, who responds to, uh, who goes on, I mean, I, or maybe, maybe I'm just antiquated, but who goes on online to spend all that time giving feedback? You either have to be really happy or really unhappy, right? But, but happy or not gathers all this data. And so um, uh, one question is, uh, going forward, um, how will this be used? How will it be merged um, into the, um, uh, the evaluation uh, uh, process? Um, 
And um, it goes beyond even things like the Colgate-Palmolive case uh, from, I think, 1997 about the installation of surveillance cameras, um, where that has to be uh, uh, bargained over. But here we're talking about not employer surveillance, but customer, uh, customer feedback. Um, there are um, uh, a lot of other ways in which uh, AI, if you uh, think about it, may change the way in which employee performance and supervision may change. Facial recognition software. You may want to know how many times somebody smiles at customers during the day. That's hard to know. You, have to have, you can't have a supervisor watching everybody, but a camera could figure that out. And what do you do with that, that information? Um, keyboards can monitor employee speed and how fast they're, they're doing things. Um, and uh, we're starting to see this. I do work in the professional sports area. Wearable technology providing input on not just how many baskets a player scores, but um, you know, what's the arc of, of the ball? How fast is the player running? For officials on the field, how fast are they running? All kinds of things that, that gets gathered and, and um, uh, new ways of making these, uh, these assessments. Um, and um, uh, uh, you know, some of these questions will be, will employers be able in a framework of, just make sure I have the, the right um, slide up there, um, will employers be able in a just cause framework to explain their decision making if they are not making the decisions, right? So if a computer analyzes somebody's performance based on their smiles, their speed, things that are never seen by a human being, you arrive at an arbitration or whatever the proceeding may be, are you able to articulate it? Or do you ask the computer, why we, why'd you make the decision? And the answer may be, I'm sorry, Dave. Hmm? I can't tell you that. <laughs> right? and, and, and if I did tell you, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> so um, these, really it was a little, a little test to see whether no, people would get, yeah. where people were, were <laughs> I'd seen that, that movie. But um, so this is a, a, a real challenge. Um, and uh, uh, Tori Whitman, who's here somewhere, had circulated something about the OECD mm -hmm. and, and in, in Europe an expectation that employers will be able, right, right employers will be able and required to explain their decision making. Mm -hmm. How will that happen in a world where the analysis and the judgment goes way beyond human capacity. Uh, and, and what does that mean for labor and employment laws uh, uh, and the expectations around that? So um, one thing I just noticed is that the, the interesting saving grace may be not in the labor laws, but in privacy laws. And something that's evolving in a separate landscape is that there are a number of states that have passed uh, laws that may have the incidental effect of preventing the gathering of a lot of the data that employers may want to use without potentially, uh, and maybe there'll be exceptions for collective bargaining or to waive these things. That's, you know, that I haven't seen that in uh, some of these laws, and it's one of the questions, you know, uh, preemption issues, but also can they be waived through collective bargaining? Um, um, but again, the, these protections and the biometric data and the stuff you're seeing in the newspapers about the fear of the collection of data through the kind of surveillance that the Chinese do on their citizens. Um, how much of that will be allowed in the private workplace um, uh, by, uh, by employers? Um, I want to touch just for a moment, because I know it's addressed <laughs> elsewhere um, by, by others, just to raise the, the issue, and then I, I think I should stop, because I'm almost, almost yeah, out of time, is um, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and other employment laws. Um, you can't ask about um, uh, applicants about their disabilities, um, but you can ask them about their ability to perform certain job functions. And, and about their non-medical qualifications and their skills. And you can ask them to show you how they would do the job um, and, and those sorts of tests. And, and those can be scrutinized in such a remarkably different way by computers. Here's one example. Um, uh, there's a bank that used AI to analyze its loan applications and found that people who fill out loan applications in capital letters are more likely to default. Right? Now that is that is not something anybody ever would have known without that kind of analysis. And so what kind of scrutiny will there be of applicants, of things that are seemingly harmless, that have nothing to do with apparent disabilities, and yet will be deemed disqualifying because uh, statistically, that's a red flag, whatever, whatever that may be, things that seem totally innocuous. And so there's a world of discrimination over these things that may not yet be protected categories, um, but, but who knows whether they, they will be uh, or not. And so there'll be things like handwriting and speech patterns and facial expressions, um, things we've just really never, uh, uh, never thought of. Um, and I'll just jump to um, disparate impact. I think I have that up there, which is 
Um, uh, one of the interesting changes about, uh, that AI is having is that the jobs that will remain, again, there's this polarization of the high and the low, but we'll, what will remain, at least for the moment, is things that involve sharing and caring and human interaction, which have often, these have traditionally been female-dominated fields. And as there are fewer of these jobs and more in competition, and as men perhaps move into these fields, and you can see that in nursing today, will there be an effect on collective bargaining and the wage pressures in those jobs, and, and perhaps, in a way, uh, less sexism um, because of the uh, greater uh, gender mixing and, and those things. I, I don't have any data behind that, but I, I'm just thinking about the, the nursing field as one, one area where that has, uh, uh, that has come up. There are others who have addressed um, elsewhere AI and Title VII disparate impact, so I, I won't uh, go into great depth um, about that except for the use of uh, big data. But I did want to just, whoops, jump to the end about the, uh, as I noted at the beginning, the WARN Act, uh, and to think about are we being realistic and what's the purpose of these laws in an era of much greater change, even when that law was passed in 1988, which seems not that long ago, but on these issues, a world, uh, a world away. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thanks, Howard. That was a very uh, comprehensive presentation. I wish you'd had a little more time to expand on some of those issues. Um, just a quick historical note that the last hot type uh, ty typographer at the New York Times retired in 2016 after being guaranteed a lifetime of employment. Um, and and that's, a, that's a field where technology has clearly had a devastating impact on workers and unions. Um, but I wanted to just throw out for a moment uh, a counter notion that we might be exaggerating a bit the, the import and the threat of new technology. Uh, to start with, um, uh, the, the Luddites, of course, that's a common uh, cultural reference point. This is 200 years ago, and uh, these were English textile workers, as most of you know, who were uh, destroying textile machinery. Um, so maybe there's always been a fear of, of technology and the impact of that on the prospects of, of workers. Um, in that vein, I found an article in The Atlantic uh, called Artificial Intelligence Has Become Meaningless. And the point of the article is that AI is often used as a buzzword in, corporate, in the corporate world. Um, and I think, as Howard mentioned, uh, genuine AI has to have important characteristics like the ability to learn over time and responses to changes in the environment. Um, otherwise, as the article put it, uh, AI is just a fancy name for a computer program. Um, and I raise this because this may tie into Howard's analysis of uh, bargaining obligations. Um, both First National Maintenance and Fiber Board, which Howard discussed but didn't have a chance to go into in, in great detail, um, uh, they both emphasize that there's no mandatory obligation to bargain if a management decision results in a significant change in the scope and direction of the enterprise, um, even if that change uh, results in layoffs, although the layoffs themselves may uh, implicate effects bargaining. Um, and I, I guess I would suggest that there may be an interest on the part of employers in uh, overstating the impact of technology um, so as to preclude bargaining. Um, and there's an interesting case which may illustrate this. It's called Winchell Company. If anyone wants to look it up, it's 315 NLRB 526. Um, and Winchell was a commercial printer that introduced um, desktop computers in order to give customers greater choice. Um, and customers were able to supply their own text and graphics on computer disks. Um, the employer then laid off uh, various artists and typesetters and uh, refused to bargain over the layoffs. Uh, the company argued that this change in technology altered the scope and direction of the business following uh, First National and Fiber Board. Um, but the board disagreed and found that the company still performed uh, the necessary steps to, pr to produce the final product to the customer. Um, the company merely engaged in slightly fewer steps than before, and there was a change in the operations, as the board put it, by degree and not kind. Um, so just as in the Atlantic article, uh, we're just talking here about a computer. Um, 
So I, I guess on the union side, it may, be, it may be important to argue that technological changes introduced by an employer uh, are not revolutionary. They don't alter the um, essential scope and direction of, of the um, enterprise. Um, and then just a couple quick notes. Um, these are areas which I'm sure Howard has dealt with, but on the union side, it's important, if possible, to make information requests about the technology um, and also to try to limit the management rights clause and prevent it from allowing technological changes uh, without bargaining. And I'll leave it at that. I think we have a few minutes if um, anyone else wants to weigh in before we move on to uh, Paul's presentation. I, I will admit that a burdensome information request like that would be a good way to hold up uh, uh, change. So uh, mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Okay. Well, but the, these, just to put some flesh on the bones, these uh, changes are, uh, are <coughs> Pretty dramatic, having been personally involved in the uh, automation of uh, financial printing, uh, which was similar to what was happening in the newspaper industry. Uh, once computerized typesetting came in, it was uh, uh, a, a good secretary uh, was better, faster at setting type than linotype operators, which had uh, as um, Bill mentioned the hot type or hot lead and uh, easily could set type at twice the speed. The line type operators naturally look down at these people as unskilled, uh, you know, compared to, uh, to them. And, um, uh, but it was clearly something that had to be bargained over. Uh, and the other thing that uh, uh, electronic typesetting did was it made it possible for customers, for example, to come into an office in New York City and the work could be done in Arizona or somewhere else. The work could be distributed among the, uh, the workplaces. And it did lead to some things like the lifetime job guarantee, which uh, you pointed out, Bill, uh, finally got to the last uh, line of type operator retiring <laughs> four, three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Paul, are you ready? I'm ready. Paul's going to add an interesting dimension he shared with me before. He's going to introduce OSHA into this uh, discussion. And so go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is ask everyone to take their smartphones or cell phones out and place them on the table in front of them. No, seriously, do it. Take your smartphone or cell phone out and put it on the table in front of you. Sam. <laughs> I'll turn them over so the screen's not facing you. How do you feel? Are, are, some of you are feeling nervous right now, right? Because there's some important text or email or social media post that you're unable to interact with. And consequently, your life has just lost some quality. Now, I know that sounds kind of silly. I know that sounds kind of overblown. But I want to make the point today that maybe the single biggest problem workers have is their addiction to their phones. And maybe addiction can be uh, extended to the word dependency. I guess dependency and addiction go together. Um, and what has happened is we have seen an increased use in the workplace by employers uh, using technology to uh, maintain control, dominion over workers through use of smartphones, emails. Uh, there's even a company in Wisconsin, my home state, that has actually started to embed chips into their employees. Now, in case you're worried about George Orwell, which I believe it's the uh, 70th anniversary of 1984, um, these are not to monitor their thoughts, it's simply to operate the vending machine or operate you know, the, 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 um, the, the vending machine, copy machine, something, something mundane, but as you can understand, that type of technology has unlimited types of consequences, potentially. 
So what I started to notice was that the United States, and this is not going to surprise anyone, uh, is a laggard when it comes to progressive employment legislation. Uh, and in particular, France and Germany, as I'll discuss in passing, have now both passed different types of laws. France is more legislation. Germany, you might call more corporate self-regulation. But they're laws that essentially try to free employees from being tied down to electronic communications uh, after work. Now, you can define work however you want. I choose generally not to physically constrain work to a geographical workplace. I think work these days, whether you're a telecommuter or a teleworker, uh, is wherever you're able to access your smartphone or your computer, uh, whether it be 35,000 feet in the air or whether it be in the most remote uh, desert in Bali, or Bali doesn't have deserts, remote tropical forests in Bali, um, desert in Algeria. Any event, um, the, the workplace is wherever you can do work, right? And so uh, work has been defined recently by the OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which the United States is part of, as being any time, any place, right? So I don't really buy into this idea that, well, you're in work, so you should be working, you're out of work, you shouldn't be working. It just doesn't work that way anymore. People work whenever they have the ability uh, to get to their cell phones, to get to their computers, to take phone calls, however it is they complete whatever task they, they have to do. So my, my talk today is a little bit um, about the right to disconnect, as I've framed it, the employee right to disconnect, but it's also about issues of, of federalism and preemption, and so I was happy when Howard mentioned the word preemption. You don't usually use the word preemption in polite company because um, it's so complicated and difficult and no one knows what in the world you're talking about. Um, I'm going to make it even more complicated by offering something that I have referred to in a paper that's coming out in the Pepperdine Law Review called the modified uh, federalism approach or modified preemption. And what I relate it to is, as most of you know, in labor law, we have very strong federal-based uh, preemption approach to traditional labor under the National Labor Relations Act. We have machinist preemption, we have Garmin preemption, we have 301 preemption, and then under ERISA, and again, you're not supposed to mention ERISA in polite company, but it is something that I focus on. ERISA preemption is supposed to be the strongest preemption known in labor and employment law, maybe even more than labor law itself. We also have conflict preemption approaches uh, where there is a conflict between state law and, and federal law. Uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act is a great example with the federal minimum wage where states have and localities have minimum wages uh, higher than uh, the federal minimum wage and that is permissible as long as they don't go underneath. Um, but we also have, and this is OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, what I would call modified federalism. This is a field preemption with a statutorily permitted opt-out within federal law permitting state-level cooperation. And as you know, there are many states that have their own occupational uh, safety and health uh, uh, agencies. Uh, Cal OSHA might be uh, the best known, but there are some 30, I believe, states now that have some form of state occupational safety and health. And I don't know if you've been reading some of the recent headlines concerning OSHA uh, in Bloomberg or some of the other um, publications that we all read, but OSHA enforcement is at an all-time low right now. Um, there are not enough inspectors, there are not enough resources, and many workplaces are simply not being inspected. Uh, I saw one statistic that based on the number of inspectors and the number of workplaces, uh, the average workplace can be uh, expected to be inspected once every 178 years. Um, that's pretty good odds that you're not going to get caught, um, or at least maybe your great-grandson will be caught or your great-granddaughter, but you won't. Um, so, but, but OSHA has this, and so what I have thought about, and, and you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, this right to disconnect, Paul, you know, this idea that you want employees to be free from their smartphones in particular when they're not at work um, and they can enjoy rest and leisure, uh, that sounds like it involves a lot of other topics. It involves what the next, uh, what Pauline and Matt will be talking about along with others. It involves privacy and autonomy. 
Um, it involves, uh, someone asked me, well, are you gonna talk about compensation? It involves exempt versus non-exempt, it, it involves uh, a lot of compensation issues, and, and it, it certainly involves rest and leisure issues. I have decided, and I'll explain why, in two different articles. The first one was in, in the Notre Dame uh, Journal of, Matt probably knows it better than I do, in the Notre Dame Journal of what, Matt? International and Comparative Labor Law, is that what it's called? I can't remember, he was there at one point. Any of it. It's their comparative and international journal. I put out the original employee right to disconnect article, and now this is the second article on federalism, which basically asks at what level, to the extent that we decide like France and Germany to have a right to disconnect of some sort for our employees, how should it be, um, how should it be uh, put together and then how should it be implemented? At what level? Federally, state, cooperative, local, um, corporate self-regulation, uh, new governance is all the rage, um, all sorts of different ways of doing it. So what I'm trying to do here today is uh, apply a modified preemption approach um, under OSHA to privacy issues, yes, but also health and safety issues surrounding current workplace problems. Okay, so this is the right to be free from employer interference by electronic communications after the workday has concluded. We're, I'm, I'm, this is a clarion call uh, to fight back uh, against the on-call nature. We all wear beepers today, if you will. Remember when it was just doctors and lawyers and other types of professionals who wore beepers? My dad was a doctor, his beeper was going off all the time. Uh, we're all carrying beepers now. We're all on call all the time, uh, I might argue. It's a, it's a modern technology-driven employment, smartphones, implanted chips, emails, and texts. So that's a little bit of an introduction. Okay, so um, there is one article I read called The Inescapable Nature of Work in the United States Workplace. And what you need to know is there are no laws currently in the United States directly dealing with whether or not employees have a right to be free from electronic communications from their employers after the workday has ended. Um, I will tell you there's been a number of studies done by uh, OSHA, uh, by uh, international organizations like the World Health Organization, but a, a majority of employees in the United States feel overworked in and overwhelmed by their jobs, and we're not alone. In Japan, it has become such a problem that they've actually coined a word, um, kuroshi, which is a Japanese extreme overwork, which can lead to death, cardiac arrest, so we're not just talking about mental breakdown. I don't know if any of you saw the article in the New York Times the other day about burnout employees. You know, is burnout real? You know, I think it is, and it might be psychological stress, it might be uh, physical manifestations of that uh, stress. Um, but that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so as I said, the, the, the right to disconnect issue can be looked at along the spectrum, because there's many detrimental impacts uh, when employees don't have the ability to disconnect from electronic communications from the workplace. There is privacy on autonomy, uh, which I would argue um, is a fundamental human right, the right to privacy, um, and I think to a certain extent our Constitution recognizes that in some forms of privacy. Certainly international uh, documents recognize that. There's safety and health. Um, U.S. Law, law now provides, uh, of course, under OSHA for training and awareness tools for employees to protect their safety and health. There's productivity and compensation issues. Uh, we could argue, I think, quite strongly that productivity of employees is decreased by the expectation to work around the clock, even if compensation increases. And sometimes, of course, compensation just stays exactly the same if you're exempt and yet you're working uh, many more hours and, and engaging in many more projects. And then there's the leisure and rest. You know, it's important for society to acknowledge that leisure and rest time for employees are important. You need time to unwind. You need time to spend with your family. I know this sounds kind of strange that I'm saying this, but in this world it seems like you have to say it. You need this time also if you want to be work-based to be creative, to be a more innovative, creative, productive uh, employee. Okay, so as far as privacy and autonomy, and again, this is really the subject of the next, uh, next panel, um, 
and, and, and Howard talked about this already. The use of electronics outside of the workplace allows employers to become more involved in an employee's private life. Um, we all know about GPS, right? You can track people such as location, what their daily routine is. Now we have these smiley faces. I hit one, by the way, in LaGuardia in the airport last night. Happy I, said. I was happy, thank okay. goodness. I was costing someone their job and I right. didn't even know it. Um, public record issues for state employees under FOIA, uh, interference with private sexual lives, uh, uh, sexual decisions. Here, think about Lawrence v. Texas, think about Obergefell, some of the uh, ways that employee, employers become aware of, you know, are you in a same sex or an opposite sex marriage? Do you live with someone you're married to? Um, all these types of issues. Um, employee privacy rights currently, and there is a disconnect, and my good friend Matt Bode has done a wonderful job as the reporter for the uh, SAM-based restatement of employment law, uh, talking about the difference between private and public employment. Uh, private employees, they have generally a state law tort invasion of privacy remedy, called it an intrusion upon seclusion. I always refer to it as my Dr. Seuss tort, uh, <laughs> intrusion upon seclusion. Um, public employees have Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, most recently in the Quan decision, Q-U-O-N, uh, talking about uh, a SWAT team member in California who was wearing uh, some form of a pager and yet using it to um, get in touch with his mistress. Um, and boy, was his wife unhappy when she found out about that. Um, but that goes to reasonable expectations of privacies and protections from unreasonable employer intrusions. Um, one possible solution that I've written about in other articles is what I've called a federal nexus test, uh, which is just based on does, in fact, the employer need to know based on some workplace concern? Is there a connection between an employer knowing something about you privately or your location or anything that somehow impacts the workplace so they have an argument that they should be allowed to know? So that, that's privacy and, and autonomy. What I want to focus more on is a possible um, federal response under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. So as, I, as, as I've mentioned, it, this is the law that most of you are familiar with, although it always seems to me like OSHA is the, the, the ugly stepchild of labor law. You know, like no one really neglected. neglected, very much. In fact, if you look like for <laughs> articles on OSHA, you'll find very little, very little written on OSHA. Um, and yet it's an extremely important law that protects the safety and, and, and health of all our employees. It sets and enforces workplace safety. The purpose is to provide employees with working conditions free from recognized hazards. Um, and my argument again here is not being able to disconnect from work after hours creates a known danger to the safety, health, and general well-being of employees. Um, so the proposal that I've come up with in previous writings is one that has broad coverage, so it would be a mandatory rule covering most employees, employers. Th I like this better than going the compensation route because there, of course, you have to worry about the exempt versus non-exempt distinction. Um, also, if you went the privacy route, you'd have to worry about public versus private employers and how they're under different standards. So this is more, as I say at the bottom of the slide, universal, more like the human right that I think it should be. It's concrete. There's no need to deal with hard to pin down squishy concepts like employee privacy and autonomy. Uh, these can be very difficult to define. It also, I think, gives some flexibility, as I'll dis as, which is, I think, important from the employer standpoint. It allows for industry or employer-specific variances. Um, you may be familiar that OSHA allows both for permanent variances and temporary variances, uh, and that might be something that works well uh, in this context. There's also under OSHA, as you may or may not know, uh, something called the General Duty Clause. This is what it says, there's the site. Employers have the general duty to furnish a workplace free uh, of hazard. Um, you might also know that OSHA has a tortured history as far as promulgating standards. Uh, most of the original standards that OSHA promulgated in 1972 to 1974 were interim standards, or they were supposed to be interim. Um, unfortunately, from 1974 to 2019, uh, 45 years, there's only been something like 50 or 60 permanent standards that have actually been promulgated, which means the lion's share, the vast majority of current OSHA standards we have, both health and safety, 
our interim uh, standards, which derive from the early 1970s. Talk about being technologically you know, not well suited uh, for our current workplace. So increasingly, uh, OSHA uh, and its enforcement agencies have drawn upon this general duty clause, which is really the only prohibition in OSHA. Um, and my argument here is that we can bring claims under the general duty clause, at least until there's a promulgation, if there ever is, of a permanent standard uh, established by OSHA regulating contact of workers through electronic communications outside of working hours. Um, and what I draw upon here is something that's being done right now under the general duty clause, which is dealing with preventing workplace violence, which unfortunately we just had a recent example in Virginia uh, of a workplace violence uh, situation. Uh, workplace violence, any physical assault, threatening behavior, or, or, or verbal abuse occurring in the work setting. Notice that there is some overlap. The, the psychological trauma that leads to workplace violence, I'm not saying that people are connected to their phones and therefore they start shooting up the workplace. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that just like workplace violence causes psychological trauma, so does being connected to your phone all the time and never having any downtime. Um, there can, of course, be intimidation and harassment through phones and, and the messages that you receive and that you have to respond to. Uh, threats or, or absence uh, of phone calls, uh, working alone or in excessive hours, that again goes back to uh, the right to disconnect. So there's, there's a really interesting overlap between what has happened with regard to workplace violence as something that has been dealt with increasingly by OSHA under the general duty clause and maybe how it could work with an employee right to disconnect. As I also said, one of the parts of OSHA that I like, not only its universality and the fact that it's been around, is that you do have this ability as states to opt out. This is the modified federalism approach. So for instance, OSHA's directive on workplace violence uh, provides an, anag an analogous uh, regulatory approach. Um, it suggests employers take precautions such as well-written and implemented after work uh, communication prevention programs. This would work with employee right to get disconnect. Um, Cal OSHA has started to keep track of the number of after work hours. Um, and OSHA, of course, permits states like California to provide more protections because it's a type of conflict preemption. Um, so uh, re this is fairly recently. Uh, California employers must implement uh, a workplace violence pro prevention plan by April 1st, 2018. Well, maybe by 2020, April 1st, 2020, they would be uh, required to implement a, uh, an employee disconnection plan. I don't know. It, it's a possibility. Um, there's also, within OSHA itself, the ability to get variances. Um, you can request a permanent variance under OSHA if an employer can demonstrate alternative means of compliance to provide its workers with safety and health protection equal or greater than under OSHA. This actually, as I've pointed out on the slide, reminds me of the self-regulatory and flexible approach that Germany's taken. Uh, such companies as Volkswagen, uh, many of the major car manufacturers and some others have actually opted out of mandatory rules the way France has mandatory rules. Um, but Germany has decided to allow employers through handbooks and through other policies they have their work councils there to come up with disconnection policies uh, to kind of police themselves. And the, 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 this is relatively new, so the verdict is still out, but it certainly is another way of considering how an employer could come to OSHA and say, hey, we're not doing it your way, but we're doing it this way and it works just as well. And that might give flexibility for certain types of, uh, of industries. So I think, I mean, there's a lot more I could say, but I want to save time for, for William's comments and also for uh, questions from the audience. So I will end it there and I'll also put up this slide if you ever wanna email me and have any questions, I'm happy to talk more. I'm, my, 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 my thoughts on this are still evolving. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Paul. Um, your research, uh, we, had, we had a chance to uh, talk uh, in the last few days and I think it's very, thought-provoking and um, your look at the French and German models was something new for me that it's very interesting. Um, I want to just throw out a few thoughts uh, first cultural maybe slash ideological and then legal issues. Um, 
And um, to begin with, I, I agree with Paul about this issue completely. On the other hand, um, I wanted to just throw out perhaps an alternative um, cultural narrative, which is that um, being able to work at home is some type of uh, liberation. Um, and we've all seen advertisements that where someone is sitting on a beach with a computer, um, and on the one hand, who wants to do work on the beach? On the other hand, if you have to do work, maybe it's fun to do it at the beach. So um, Paul also mentioned the, this company, uh, Three Square Market um, in Wisconsin. Um, as I understand it, they provide self-service mini markets to hospitals, which doesn't sound like Medicare for all, but <laughs> they have um, pioneered in one important area. They offer employees, as Paul said, the right to have a microchip injected into your hand. Um, sorry. It's called uh, Three Square Market. It's um, going to call for a microchip tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, yeah, I'll get to that in a moment. About a third of the employees have done this. Um, they can wave their hand over a computer to log in. The main example given by uh, the article I found is an MIT technology review, and they should know about technology. Um, they said, let's see, their headline is, this company embeds microchips in its employees, and they love it. <laughs> and the example given is that the employee can wave his hand at a vending machine and receive a Diet Dr. Pepper. So that was the main <laughs> pur purpose of the microchip. Um, so. It, it's easy to make fun of stuff like this, but I guess my point is that people today love, they love gadgets, and maybe the right to disconnect is not as important as it might have been in the past. Um, on the legal plane, just a few quick comments. Um, I think, as Paul has mentioned in his articles, um, which I had the pleasure to, to read, um, OSHA is a great tool here, but I would think collective bargaining through, through a union would be the best tool. Um, a union can do more to control um, encroachments on leisure time by, by employers, including, uh, in, in my practice, I've negotiated provisions where if a, if a worker's required to come in, even for an hour on the weekend, he or she will be paid uh, eight hours pay. Um, that's one example. On the other hand, as Paul noted, given the low rates of unionization, um, most employees are employed at will and can't do much to combat their uh, employer's demands. Um, Paul also made reference to uh, the FLSA as a way to deter excessive work hours. Um, as he mentioned, there's a problem with a large number of employees who are exempt um, from the overtime regulations. Um, however, the Department of Labor um, has just a few months ago proposed to raise the uh, threshold salary for exempt employees from roughly 24,000 to roughly 35,000. Um, the Obama administration, you, probably many of you know the background, was looking to raise it much higher, but it's still uh, progress um, and will uh, make uh, many more employees non-exempt. Um, we could also look to state and local statutes. Um, uh, for example, New York City recently passed a scheduling law which um, essentially prohibits on-call scheduling and generally requires um, 72 hours notice of, um, of a schedule. Um, having said all that, I think I agree with Paul's central point and, um, um, and I think the, the use of OSHA is very intriguing and I'll leave my comments to that. Sam? Sam? Thank you. Um, on the NLRA issue, the difference between decision and bargaining. Speaker? Okay. Speaker? Yes. Tyler and I own the Terrific panel. Identify yourself. Sam S. <laughs> <laughs> Sam S. Stryker, uh, NYU, and, and gig worker. I'm also a gig worker. Um, <laughs> Platform-based gig worker. NYU is my platform. Um, anyways, a terrific presentation, and uh, it's good to have Paul back. He's he's participated here before, and Howard is a new member of the Labor Center uh, board, and Bill has been here before as well. That's great. Um, on the NLRA issues, the distinction between decision bargaining and effects bargaining, 
And you know, one problem with, for, I think First National Maintenance is basically right, that there can't be decision, there can't be bargaining over decisions that fundamentally change the enterprise because we don't want the unions to win. We always have this image in our head that the question is whether the unions will in, agree to concessionary bargaining. Most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, if the employer thinks that a concession is available from a union, they'll talk to the union. They don't need the law. The duty to bargain is about your right to insist. Can it be a basis for a strike or some other kind of concerted action? But the problem is effects. And here's a timing question. And I think the, the, the court, sort of in a throwaway line in First National Maintenance, said it has to be at a meaningful time and whatever that means. Effects bargaining is very important as a practical matter. And if, in future iterations of your presentation, please focus on that question. What's entailed by it? No, you don't write it down. <laughs> Matt will tell you for the publication what, what's entailed by effects bargaining and when it must occur. So that's from the standpoint of re legal requirements. Companies would be wise, in my view, it's been my advice to companies, to engage in decision bargaining. If you've got a deal in effects bargaining, why draw a distinction there? Avoid the legal issues, which can create problems down the road. Some companies, like General Electric, we use this in our supplement to our casebook, for General Electric used to have this reputation for being bullwareist shop named after its labor relations director. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, for the last uh, many years, 25 years, they engaged in a very extensive effects bargaining, which includes the decision as well, with uh, information uh, that is transferred, because they want to see if they can nip problems, not only legal problems, morale problems, and maybe the workers have something to contribute. So I think that is a, an approach that needs to be uh, you know, advance more in the labor management front. I, I, go ahead. I, say, I, say, I, think, I think most employers take the view that they treat something even if they don't acknowledge it as they'll talk about the decision and, and the distinction between the term discuss and negotiate is often something that uh, a, a, lot, a lot hangs on. Yeah. I, I also wanted to bring up something that um, Howard had mentioned which is as of May 22nd, so just three weeks ago, 42 countries have now adopted a new OECD principle on artificial intelligence. Where's Tori? Uh, Tori sent it to us, so thank you, Tori. And one of the things that I found interesting when I actually read, it's a recommendation. I don't know if people understand how the OECD works, but a recommendation is not something like a treaty that you have to implement. It is kind of a moral requirement. They want you to consider national legislation or other legislation to put these in place. But one of the things they talk about in the statement is building human capacity and preparing for labor market transformations, meaning effects bargaining. So for instance, they talk about um, government should take steps, including through social dialogue, which is the European term for you know, the stakeholders to talk, to ensure a fair transition for workers as AI is deployed such as through training programs along the working life, support for those affected by displacement, uh, and access to new opportunities in the labor market. That's all effects bargaining, right? That's all about understanding what type of impact AI is going to have on workers and getting, a, getting ahead of it, you know, so that you can put uh, programs in place. You know, you were joking about, oh, war in 60 days. Woo hoo, you know, what am I gonna do with those 60 days of notice? Um, it, it's not enough. The training that's, that states provide right now is inadequate um, given the level of, of technology that we're talking about. So maybe this type of uh, principle and recommendation on artificial intelligence will be another push to get people to start thinking about these issues of worker displacement and, and AI. Well, and just one related thought is yeah. that there seems to be a crisis of both underemployment and overemployment, is what you're yeah, saying, we were right? Talking so, about that too, yeah. so the extent that you narrow people to a specific working day, that frees up perhaps the other half of the day for somebody else to do that job. I mean, in theory, I don't know if that works in practice, but there's some element of that. Yeah. Just another quick observation on First National, which is that I, Howard may have pointed this out, but it explicitly um, does not consider automation. There's a footnote. Um, and so that's one reason that this area is, is very unresolved and conflicted, I think. Um, there are also conflicts uh, between, you think, Howard, between um, Fiber Board and, and, First, and National First National. National. And, in, yeah. and indeed, uh, one of the circuit courts I noted uh, in my deck made that, uh, made that point that the, uh, the NLRB had not 
been clear in reconciling those two cases that there are different considerations, um, um, different frameworks, and I granted one's about outsourcing, but is that really a crisp, crisp distinction when you're talking about replacement of, of those who are now doing the work? Right. Uh, hi, uh, Jonathan Harris here at NYU Law. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I've been thinking some about the implications of automation in the, the non-unionized setting um, uh, as it relates to labor law, um, you know, when there's no bargaining. Um, and, you know, we saw, for example, last month a, a strike by Uber drivers. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we've been seeing the teacher strikes over, you know, the past couple years that have seemed to be a lot more spontaneous. Um, you know, I'm curious if, if there's been thought to sort of collective responses to uh, automation in the non-unionized setting, um, if you could anticipate more um, activities like that, or on the other hand, is it like putting one more nail in the coffin where it's like, okay, well, they're going on strike, so, you know, that's even one more reason why we need to get robots to do their jobs. I mean, I would say as a starter, I think that the protests that you're seeing about immigration are misunderstood protests against automation. I mean, it's, I mean, to me, the, there's been a, a mass recognition of there's this fear, but it's been focused in the wrong place. You've, you've got protests against, uh, against immigrants, and that's not, as Barack Obama pointed out, that's not the, the enemy. I, I think it's just as a sort of social observation. Uh, the, the other thing that I would point out is that if you consider like McDonald's for a second, what are some of the issues there? One of the issues is there is tremendous amount of control over workers' everyday life. How many fries they produce, how many burgers they produce, how quick are they at the cash register? Um, this is all run through algorithms and it's kind of like the happy button that Howard was talking about, that this comes back in performance reviews and performance evaluations. Um, and it also goes back to uh, something that Chairman Ring was talking about, which is the joint employer standard, um, which for many a year uh, had been about whether or not the, um, the two employers have a relationship such that one has meaningful control over the, the, the terms and conditions of employment in the other. Uh, one of the ways that McDonald's Corporation keeps control over its franchisees is through these types of artificial intelligence systems that they've put into place to make their franchisees more productive. So um, the last point I'll make is that social media and the information age has caused Section 7 rights outside of the union to explode. Um, I have a, a number of case books. I think Sam's okay if I say that. Um, but we have actually decided to put a separate chapter just on non-union Section 7 rights, just because it's so robust right now, and talking about how people talk to each other on Facebook, uh, through change.org. Uh, there's another uh, website that people use to bring kind of petitions. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But yeah, 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 thank you. Um, and, and all these together have, I think, made it more likely that in fact employees are going to be using artificial intelligence to fight back against some of these um, displacement type situations that I talked about that AI is causing. So to answer your question, I see AI being used in some ways as an equalizer, as something that is accessible, that is fairly inexpensive, and that employees can use in a non-union way to organize we're collectively, um, what's, the, what's the word our, our friend Miriam Cherry uses all the time? Crowd, crowdsource or crowd? What? Crowdsourcing, yeah, it's crowdsourcing, right? So I, I think that's, that's a huge tool for employees today. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Rogoff. I'm with the U.S. Department of Labor. And I wanted to uh, comment and ask a question about the use of OSHA specifically the general duty clause yeah. as a potential remedy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could st I'll start by saying that in uh, the New York office, OSHA is not a stepchild to anyone. Probably about 40% of our time is okay. dedicated to OSHA work, and a good deal of cases involve uh, novel uses, what I'll call novel or untraditional uses of the general duty clause. We've handled la large cases involving crowd management. Mm. We've handled cases involving workplace violence, uh, heat stress cases. Yeah. 
And we, we definitely see, you know, it, it serves a, a really critical role in protecting employees when there's been a gap. But in the course of doing so, we've become painfully aware of limitations that the general duty clause presents. Um, mm -hmm. You always run into issues of fair notice when dealing with the regulated community. You deal with issues of different industries. Mm -hmm. And as part of the general duty clause, as, as you probably know, there needs to be uh, determination that the, either the employer recognizes the hazard or the industry as a whole recognizes the hazard. And yeah. when you're dealing with industries that are diverse, yeah. what could be ha deemed hazardous in one industry is not necessarily the other. And given that there's now been like a push, for example, you're, uh, with mm -hmm. workplace violence, to yeah. try to come up with a standard yeah. to try to deal with some of those issues. I was yeah. wondering if you could comment why the general duty, why you look, you're looking to the general duty clause as a way to maybe address some of these issues rather than maybe ta tackling it straight on with a standard. Yeah, no, I would prefer a standard, absolutely. I would want a permanent standard. I have just taught OSHA now for 17 years and I am extremely skeptical about standards surviving the process of promulgation um, because of the fact that you know, the, the standard, of course, is substantial evidence, and then you have to have scientific or other types of um, um, information to back it up. Almost every single regulation that has been put out by OSHA over the years has been challenged by industry. Um, there's also the Congressional Review Act, uh, where, I don't know if you remember all the way back in the Clinton years, the ergonomic standard. They spent eight or nine years on that, only to have it overturned by Congress. Uh, in 2001, I believe. Um, similarly, if you look, now I'm going to put on my ERISA hat, if you look at the um, uh, fiduciary rule, um, 10 years were put into the fiduciary rule only to be struck down by a nationwide injunction a couple years ago. So I think what I'm trying to do, and I, I try as a professor, I think Sam and I, he, he won't like that I'm saying we're alike in some ways, but Sam and I are very both very pragmatic, very practical. We're good in the positive <laughs> ways, but practically and pragmatically is what I'm thinking. And so what I thought is use the general duty clause as a gap filler for the ways that you're using it on all those great topics that you've talked about, but work towards a permanent standard both federally, if you can get it, and at the same time get the more activist states like California through Cal OSHA to start doing what I would call the laboratories of experimentation. You know, this is why I call it workplace federalism because I do believe states have a very important role to play in trying out policies to see whether they work on a smaller scale before then going, or maybe it's easy, just easier to get it on a larger scale as a permanent standard under OSHA once it's proved successful in one of these states. And I can definitely appreciate the gap yeah. filling element yeah. is something we see all the time. But yeah. Have you given any thought as to steps you could take to make it more a more clearly recognized hazard across industries, because unless yeah. you're going to get them to identify it as a hazard, that's what you're going to need to be able to show under the general duty clause. So you would need legislation, and as you know, getting labor and employment legislation in this country is close to impossible. Um, and so what I would want is something that you see, for instance, in the Family and Medical Leave Act. The Family and Medical Leave Act has a provision which says you need to put your family medical leave policy into the employee handbook. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was legislation that said, similarly, you have to have a disconnection uh, policy and, and, and it has to meet certain standards. I feel like in other areas, like with the internet, with computers, um, with privacy expectations, when handbooks are being put together, employers, when they're you know, talking to Proskauer or another, another great law firm, they're being told, you know, you need to think about these topics. Would you say they're being advised right now on disconnection issues? I, I would be surprised if they were. They are, but only for, frankly, wage and hour concerns. Wage and hour yeah. concerns, okay. I'd like to give Gene Eisner a chance to speak because sure. he was my first boss, so it's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, William. Um, Gene Eisner. Um, Following up on uh, Professor Secunda's concerns about how AI is uh, big brother uh, and it's creeping uh, day by day, uh, coincidentally today in the New York Times, the ACLU has an article about how AI is, is creeping 
uh, and I urge everybody to read it, um, uh, and, and expressing concern about how uh, everyday life is now being taken over by AI. Now, so much for the uh, concern about society, which we're, I'm sure we're all concerned about. But in, in, the, in the workplace, I represent a group of retail workers and the, in the maintenance department, uh, an older worker went into the dressing room to sit down because he was tired. And he sat there for 10 minutes and then he was disciplined and it was brought to the union's attention. How did you know that that older worker was sitting in the dressing room for 10 minutes? Well, they said, we saw him on the camera. Surveillance. So cameras are now in the dressing rooms. And we said, wait a minute, you never told us about that. And first of all, you shouldn't even have cameras in the dressing room. Violation of the general obligations law in New York. <laughs> in any event, uh, we filed a grievance and they, they pulled it and, 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 and not only that, but it turns out that they had these cameras all over the place, uh, tracking workers wherever they were moving. Uh, and we objected to that saying, uh, you can't, if you want to do that, you have to bargain with us over it. And, and we, we, we pulled those cameras uh, from throughout the store. And this is very dangerous, what, what the uh, employers uh, are trying to implement now in, in industry. Agreed. Okay, uh, it's time for a break. One last question. Me? Yeah. yeah. I deal with this problem. Um, it's called on call. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I represent employed doctors. Mm. So uh, in clinics specifically, but to be the hospital, um, they bring, they have a thing called an on call thing that uh, instead of having uh, three doctors, you have two doctors and one of them is on call. And uh, so what is a suggestion for a positive proposal outside of pay mm -hmm. to deal with the issue of on-call, because the yeah. issue of on-call relates to underemployment yeah. of a particular number of people in that particular department. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 doctor's my dad, but that's okay. He is a doctor and he was on-call. Yeah, me neither. Um, but in any event, um, there's a number of cases that I teach in the wage and hour part of my course on on-call employees uh, talking about the freedom to do what you want to during the time you're on call. So the more restrictions there are on your time, the, 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 you know, the radius that you can travel in. I think some of these policies don't allow you to drink alcohol when you're on call or, or take other mind-altering uh, substances. Uh, the court has generally held, I don't know if there's a Supreme Court case on it, but there's a lot of circuit court cases on this, uh, saying that it really goes to the freedom of the person to do what they want to while they're on call. The, the, the case that I'm thinking of involves a guy who actually serviced the machinery or the, the technology in the hospital, in the operating room, and he was the only one. And he was on call, and he was you know on a 20-mile radius, and he couldn't drink, and... You know, the employer said, well, you can still go to the mall, you can still get dinner out with your family. And, and by the way, it came up as a compensation issue, you know, whether he should be compensated for the time that he was in call. And the majority, it was a two-to-one decision, the majority said, no, you can't be compensated because you still have enough time to do what you want to during that time period. Uh, the dissenting opinion said, well, there's only one of them. There's not another person who can relieve this guy. He's it. You know, and it's hospital equipment. I mean, nothing more important than working hospital equipment when someone's in surgery. So um, there, there is some dispute over when people should be compensated on call. Um, I would also say that in your situation, of course, that on-call doctor is not always on call, right? He, he rotates off or she the rotates off. The doctor's employed and then uh, yeah. they, have, they have a right to call him. The yeah. issue isn't phone call. No. It, it's, it's call him in. 
Exactly, and, and, and so I guess my point from the right to disconnect standpoint is that even with doctors or lawyers or um, anyone uh, who has the need to be free from some work obligation, the disconnection right is really important. Well, you put together a policy that talks about when and under what circumstances there are exceptions to the general default rule that people should not be contacted after work through electronic communications. Now, for doctors who are on call, there might have to be a special rule. That was where I was talking about variances and kind of having exemptions for certain occupations, but that could be worked out, I think. But that would be my general rule, which is people should be left alone after work. They should have time with their families, they should have leisure, they should be able to do whatever they want to except work. And they should be entitled to take a break that's scheduled for them. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it.